Good morning and welcome on this first day of May to Elam Chapel and church service. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33. Matthew 14, 22 to 33. It's a very familiar passage to many of us. Uh, heard it through the years. It's the story of Peter walking on the water. I'm going to take it a little bit different today. I, I tend to do that anyways um, to encourage you. My sermon title is Do Not Be Afraid to Do the Impossible. So throughout the message today, I want you to be thinking about things that God is speaking for you to do that you're hesitant to do or you're scared to do due to uh, whatever rationale. And normally it's going to be fear. So let me read the passage to you. Matthew 14, 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied. Tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed, in, when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come together to worship you through the many miles that separate us. Pray that you would bless all who are uh, watching this in Zoom and in person. Pray that you would be with us today, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would encourage us no matter where we might be in life. Now, we can do anything that you ask us to do. We can do the impossible. I ask that you would give me uh, the words to speak, that we would glorify and honor you in every way. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So this is a familiar passage. Many, many times has this sermon, there have been a sermon on this passage, Peter walking on water. But I really don't want to focus so much on Peter walking on water, even though that is an absolute miracle. And as far as we know, there are only really two that walked on water, and that's Jesus and Peter. But I really want to focus on the fact of what prohibits us from getting out of the boat. I remind you that Peter walked on water, the 11 stayed in the boat. They just watched. And I think too often in church today, we are bystanders to what God is doing, and we never get out of the boat. And the tool that Satan uses, the most effective tool that Satan will use against you and I, is fear. Some might say it's pride. I think pride ranks up there. But if I had to pick a rationale as to why I was less hesitant to do what God has called me to do, or to step forth in the way that God would choose me to step forth, I would have to say it is fear. And fear is the absence of love, and fear is the absence of faith. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about faith today. And to many within the church, they have made faith a quantified measure. But the Bible says if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. Now, some people think that literally you can literally move a mountain, and that's not really what they're talking about. It's more about you can move your problems if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. Now, if you've ever seen a mustard seed, it's tiny. 
but it grows into a humongous tree. So I'm not here today to say how much faith you need. I'm here to say if you have faith. And that's kind of what scriptures points to more than anything. I mean, otherwise, what happens is we quantify it and we look at someone who maybe but not healed or maybe something didn't happen that they've been praying for. And we immediately say, well, you don't have enough faith. I don't see that so much. I mean, I don't even see Jesus looking at, at, at Peter when he sinks, saying, well, Peter, you had 87% faith. If you were at 90%, you would have sank slower. Or maybe if you were at 99%, you would have gone down, but your head would have stayed above water. I don't see that analogy. The analogy I see is that you either have it or you don't have it. And Jesus tends to rebuke you and I and the disciples by the lack of versus the, the quantified measure of. Because how do you quantify faith? And that's just a thought. How do you quantify error? Well, in the medical community, we do a post ox. Stick it on the end of your finger, and we know how much O2 is in your blood system and in your body by room air. So we can do that. But how do you quantify how much air you have in a room right now? We really can't. So I, I don't want to focus so much about you know, walking on water, which tends to be the focus. I want to focus more into why we don't do what Peter did, what holds us back from the things of God. And fear, as I told you, is Satan's best tool against you and I. Fear of anything. I mean, there's so many phobias out there that if I did a printout, I would get three pages solid of different phobias. In fact, the Greek word for fear is phobia, which is where we get the word phobia. And in the Greek, the word fear means bone chilling fear. We're talking your blood stops, your heart stops, and you're frozen. You don't know what to do. That's the type of fear that scripture talks about. How many people never share their faith with anyone because they're fearful of what people might think or say? Or they're fearful of how the presentation would be? I still remember in Bible college taking evangelism class with Dr. Paul Gibson. Pastor Michael would remember that class too. And we were told the Roman Rocky Road of evangelism. I have learned since that day to let the Holy Spirit speak to me to share the truth and remember the key verses that he places in my heart than trying to remember a set mantra. But I remember the first time I shared the gospel with someone and was in the military, I was scared. I was frightened. And fear entered my heart like, I may not make it, but God is faithful. And so we see this in this scripture. How many times do we miss the opportunities to do the things of God because of fear? How many times do we miss the opportunity to speak a word of life to someone because of fear? How many times do we stop our movement with God because of fear? And it doesn't really matter how long you've been a Christian or not. Every one of us is going to struggle with this word called fear because, simply put, is extremely effective to stop us from doing. So I'm going to give you an example. Good morning. This is Channel 5. I have great, great news, great whatever news that they say when they are on TV. So you can tell I don't do that. I have great news for you to know. Important news, critical news. I am here at West LA and I want to report to you that if everybody stacks all the National Geographic to one location, it will literally sink this continent. I just want to let you know that. If everybody leaves the beach with the same amount of sand that they take off, then that sand will erode the coastlines and we will no longer have a place to live. Even more important, this is critical, catch this because you need to know this. Everybody who eats pickles dies. And did you know that pickles cause cancer, communism, airline tragedies, auto accidents, and crime waves? Pickles do. Did you know that? Did you know that 100% of all soldiers who eat pickles die one day? Just saying. I mean, when rats are fed 20 pounds of pickles, they become obese. I want you to know this. Now, 
You can't eat a pickle anymore without fear. I mean, we live in a world, if you watch the news, you will find yourself fearful to do anything. Chocolate was bad. Chocolate is good. Coffee was bad. Coffee is good. No one can make up their mind. And everything in the world out there is changed over every two or three years. I mean, I remember being in Kenya uh, back in 1998. And I was ministering to a group of pastors, teaching them how to pastor and be a team. And so uh, I picked up the local newspaper and I started reading it. And I was like, oh man, I don't want to go outside. I don't want to leave because the crime was unbelievable. Until the pastor I was with looked at me and said, oh, pastor, that newspaper is for the entire country of Kenya. So I want you to imagine for a moment, if we received all the news of the entire country of America every morning, you would not leave your home. I mean, I'm hesitant to want to leave my home anyways in LA because you, all the car accidents, you never want to have a home on, on the bottom level because cars run into it in, in California. I mean, I'm from Maine. We don't ever have cars running the houses. Even in the wintertime, it doesn't happen. But here in LA, I can guarantee you, once a week, we have a car going into a home. It's unbelievable. I mean, I can, I can literally say, I understand why so many people are having mental health issues because of the word fear. So now let's set the stage. And this is really interesting. Jesus had just got done feeding the 5,000. Now, we know it was more than 5,000 because back then they only counted men. So we know we had women and children. So you could probably take that number up to 15 to 20,000 people were fed, which is a phenomenal number. He feeds them. He looks at the disciples and tells them, the Greek there is an imperative, get into the boat. And he tells them to cross to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, Jesus goes up to pray. The 12 disciples get in the boat. Majority of them are fishermen. They go out to the Sea of Galilee, and you have to assume safely that he sent them probably around uh, dusk, just as it's starting to turn dark, which probably might be about 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, dictating at night. So they go out, and the Greek indicates no matter which way the boat went, the wind was going against them. So we know it was a supernatural wind because winds don't do that. They either run one direction, they might shift to a second direction. But generally speaking, in sailing, you can always turn your boat and catch the wind. So they're out there rowing because the wind's not working with them. And wherever they put the bow of the boat, the wind was going. So if they went left, the wind was blowing at them. Right, the wind was blowing at them. Straight, the wind was blowing at them. It did not matter what direction the boat was facing. The wind was against them. And they were doing this till the fourth hour, which is generally anywhere between three o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the morning. So do your math. At the greatest amount of time, they're rowing the boats for about 11 hours. At the least amount of time, it's probably about eight hours. And I want you to think how that must be if you're rowing your boat against the wind for eight to 11 hours, how you must be feeling in that moment. And in that moment, Jesus, or they didn't know yet, somebody comes walking across the water. And they freaked out and were fearful because they thought it was a ghost. Now, I don't know about you and I, but I probably would say that before I became a Christian, if I saw somebody walking across the water, it would really have caused a little bit of fear within me. Back in that day and time, apparently they had enough spiritual belief that they could believe things were happening. Because here's a key point that you need to grab, and I'm going to say it now and I'll say it later. They recognized Jesus being the Son of God after he got into the boat with Peter and the storm went flat. But not before. And I'm thinking in my analytical little mind. Well, why didn't they believe he was the son of God when he fed the 5,000? 
Why didn't they believe he was the, was the son of God when he healed the people? So apparently in Palestine, they were accustomed to seeing certain miracles. And that's important for you to hear. We know in the Old Testament that God would move upon the prophets and there would be miracles. We know in the New Testament, Jesus moved through, I mean, God moved through Jesus in miracles and ultimately the apostles and the church. And Jesus says to us that we will do more than what he did because we are his children. So why didn't they grab it earlier? I mean, he just fed 15 to 20,000 people. Isn't that an awesome miracle? And yet here comes someone walking across the water and they are scared and frightened. Now we know that the circumstances of the storm caused some of that. We know that the, the uh, aspect of not being able to get from A to B caused that. We know that being without Jesus caused that. But we also have to understand that they fully did not recognize who he was at that point. And so here they go. They're focusing on the storm. They're focusing on everything that is going wrong. And we do the same thing. And then all of a sudden, here comes someone walking across the water, and they are now fearful. So let me share a fundamental theological truth. If you focus on anything outside of Jesus, you will be fearful. If you focus on Jesus, you will not be fearful. It's got to be where your eyes are at. Where is your focus? And that's important for you to understand in here. So what, excuse me, what happens? They cry out and he tells them, hey, be at peace. It is I. And it kind of reminds me of the passage in Exodus where Moses is in, the, in front of the burning bush and God says, I am, I am. <laughs> One second. And so here we have, Moses' fears are relieved by the I am, the I am. And Jesus, in similar fashion, tells the disciples, it is I, be at peace. And here's Peter. You got to love Peter. I mean, Peter had to have been a sanguine cleric. He just had to have been. Because, boy, if it's you, call me out of the walk on water. Now, I don't know about you and I, but I'm melancholy enough that I probably would not have said that. I probably would just sat in the boat and said, okay, it's him. He'll come to me. So Peter gets out of the boat. Now, a lot of people think that the boats were like our boats. They're not. You've been to Uganda, Kenya, and you'll find that the boats are very different from what we use here. And so he had to climb up to climb down. And the scriptures indicate that the storm was running rampant anyway. So waters and waves, and, and to those of us who were in the military and served on naval ships, we have been in some rough waters. I, I remember being a guest on a frigate in the North Sea, and literally the, the frigate was leaning this way, and you could literally walk on the bulkhead. And so Sean probably remembers something like that. You know, same kind of concept. And so, you know, here he is, fearful. He gets out to climb down. The waves are going any, everywhere. The water is going everywhere. And, and he heads out to Jesus. Uh, have you ever had that moment when you just impulsively done something and you got out far enough away and went, oops, what did I just do? Well, that was Peter. I remember one time my older brother talked to me and said, hey, you want to ride this bull? And I said, sure, without thinking. And got on that bull. I thought, this is great. And so the bull decided to fuck me off. And then I'm thinking, what went through my mind to get on a bull in the first place? I mean, there are times in life that we do things and we impulsively step out 
And our brain catches up with our actions. And that's what happened to Peter. All of a sudden, he realized, oh, man, the waves are awesome. Wow, that's a big one. Woo, the wind's blowing. What in the world did I do? Jesus. And he starts to sink. The beauty is he must have gotten out far enough from the boat that Jesus was able to reach down, grab his hand. And what I love about this part of the story is that even in our doubts, our unbelief, and our fears that cripple us at times, Jesus is willing to grab our hand. And so you you got to go back to where your focus is. As Peter is sinking, his focus is Jesus. Jesus brings him up from the water. And they walk back in that storm to the boat. So here I can imagine Jesus holding Peter's hand as they walk across the water with the waves going everywhere. Waves coming up, waves coming down, and, and they're doing the same thing. They're walking on water. And the wind's blowing. Now, I don't believe that, that Jesus had a force field about him and he didn't get wet. I believe he was wet. I believe his hair was bendy. I believe that the waves got him wet. It doesn't matter how you view it. I do not believe there was a circular um, force field around Jesus and Peter. I believe that Jesus walked on the water and the wind was blowing. And the story continues that when they got into the boat, it all died. Now, there's another passage in another gospel that tells the storyline a little bit differently, where Jesus literally commands the wind and, and the waters. To, to die down. And I like to add that part because Jesus' words carry power. So Jesus speaks the winds, Jesus speaks to the waters, and they die. And now they're in the boat. So what about the other 11? I mean, what happened to them? You got 11 other people in the boat, including John the Beloved. Jesus' cousin. And they didn't get out of the boat. What is their excuse? That's an interesting question to be posed. Why didn't Jesus look at them and go, you 11 didn't even try? Or is it the issue that we step out to do what God calls us to do, and then we become fearful and we stop? We catch the rebuke. You have little faith versus the one who doesn't even move. It's an interesting question to be posed this morning. Is it better to step and fail or not step at all? Well, that's something theologians can say. So I'm going to argue from two points. I would say both are wrong. If you step out to follow God and you allow your fears to cripple you, to stop you, versus looking to him who saved you, then I think you're just as guilty as Peter was, ye of little faith. But I also think that the other 11 that we seldom ever talk about, those 11 disciples who sat in that boat didn't move. And I think that they are as equally Guilty because they were spectators to see what happened. Now, let's change the storyline a little bit. Let's say Peter walked all the way to Jesus, got to Jesus, never sank, never doubted, never had fear. He's there with the Lord. What would the other 11 have done? I would, I would like to believe that the other 11 would have, whoa, look, Peter did it. I can do it and jump out of the boat and go. But I've been pastoring long enough to realize that a lot of Christians aren't going to get out of the boat, no matter what you do, because it isn't so much just an issue of fear, it's an issue of passion. And what you need to understand is that fear cripples your passion. Fear cripples the passion in your heart that you become, honestly, lukewarm. And Revelation speaks to the letter to the church that I'd rather you be hot or cold. 
hot because you're moving. Cold means you can get saved. But if you're lukewarm, God says, I will spew you out of my mouth. And I have to sit there and think that the 11 that sat in that boat and did nothing, where was their passion? Or were they just tired? You know, I rode all night. You know, I got a good excuse. I rode for eight or 11 hours, Jesus. I'm tired. Jesus, do you understand what I'm facing? The waves are like eight foot tall waves, Jesus. I'm only five foot one. Jesus, the wind is strong enough that it would blow me everywhere. Jesus, don't you understand? I've worked all day. What excuses do we make like the 11 did? I mean, even John, the beloved, didn't get out of the boat. No one did. But Peter, the impulsive Peter, the Peter who spoke a lot of times before thinking. But it's the very same Peter who became the head of the church in, in Jerusalem and who died for the Savior. That's the Peter I'm talking about. I mean, I've had Peters in my church. Man, sometimes they're a headache. And sometimes it's like the greatest thing since sliced bread. Honestly. So why do we doubt if we see Jesus doing the very thing that we want to do? Why do we hesitate? Why do we say not today? I mean, do you know how many Christians put off the things of God to the next day? Why? I mean, sometimes you need to because you need wisdom to know what to do. And sometimes it's just not the spirit moving you to do. But when God speaks, we need to move. We need to act upon what God is saying to us at that moment. But we need to do it in wisdom and with power. And it needs to be God. If it's not God, you're going to end up being the seven sons of Sceva getting beat up by a demon-possessed individual running down the street butt naked. And that's what happens when we move in our strength. If I do it according to Gregory Scott Benson, Gregory Scott Benson's knowledge and all that I've known and learned, then I will fail every time. I am nothing more than a band-aid. But if I do it in Jesus, it can change the world. It can turn the world upside down. That's true of anything we do. And sometimes when we, when we talk about this passage, we, it's almost like inferred that we've got to go out to some dark jungle of Africa or in the Pacific New Guinea and, and save the headhunters. That's not necessarily what God's saying. What God's saying is get out of the boat and whatever it is that he's speaking to you and step on water and move with Jesus. That's what he's saying. It's not, you know, we get too much. And I remember in Bible college thinking the same thing. You know, my testimony was weak. I didn't do drugs. I didn't do alcohol. I wasn't in a motorcycle uh, hell's angel gang. You know, I didn't do this. I didn't kill people. I didn't rape people. I didn't do anything. I just grew up in Jesus. And I thought I didn't have any testimony, but I realized that I had the greatest of testimonies because I lived my life with Jesus from an early age. And so sometimes when pastors preach this, the automatic thought is, well, I got to sell my home, sell my, my you know, everything and, and get on a plane and just go somewhere and do the things of God. God is calling you to do whatever God calls you to do, wherever you may be, in California, Maine, Louisiana, it doesn't matter where you're at. He wants you to get out of the boat to walk with him and not allow fear to hold you captive to where you don't do it. And that might be speaking to somebody where you work. It might be sharing the gospel if you're at goodwill. It might be um, helping somebody. It may be uh, being a blessing to your family. It might be, you know, you're facing a hard time with family. And God's saying, step out of the boat with me. Trust me, I will keep you as you walk with me. It doesn't necessarily mean some great giant, wow, because everything that you do for God is a great giant, wow. <clears throat> we have quantified too many things, and we've held people back and made them feel like they're lesser than anything. But Jesus says, if you're faithful and obedient to him, then you are the good and faithful servant. 
you could be that as a pastor. You could be that as a doing janitorial work in a church, but just as important, or a Sunday school teacher, or someone who just encourages someone. Stop quantifying the ministry and just start doing the ministry. Get out of your boat. Ask yourself that question. What boat are you in? And don't try to put other people in your boat. Don't sit there and look at me and go, well, you know, Pastor, you need to get on your boat. How do you know what boat I'm in? Get out of your own boat and let God deal with me. Get out of your boat and don't put other people in there. Well, you know, I get out of my boat on my wife. On my kids. On my dog. Don't. Just get out of the boat. The 11 never did. The 11 had the greatest of opportunities. Could you imagine what it would look like if 12 people jumped out of the boat and started walking to Jesus? I mean, there would have been group encouragement. Peter starts to sink. Come on, Peter, hold him up. And off they go. John starts to sink. Peter says, no, 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 I'm not going to let you do that. Up you go. I mean, there was some truth that probably part of Peter's fear is that no one else did it besides him. What would have happened if 12 got out? Would you imagine all the other boats in the area that are just going along and wondering why this one boat just can't get anywhere? And they see 12 guys jump out and running to Jesus? I mean, that would have been an awesome story. But the, the point of the issue is, is that they didn't recognize who Jesus really was until they got into the boat. And beloved, that's the issue. Scripture says it's at that point they realized he was the son of God. Why didn't they recognize it before? And what has to happen in our lives, yours and mine, to come to recognize that he is the son of God? Because every fear you and I have has already been conquered by the cross. He is the very God of the very God. He is the son of God. What evidence do you need and I need to believe that we can do the impossible? I mean, what is it in your life today that's stopping you? We are living in a time in a church today that honestly, we're not in a good position nationally. And God is looking for people as he has throughout history, who will say, yes, I'll get out of the boat. Yes, I'll believe. What is he saying to you? Notice how I'm reading that. What is he saying to you? What is he calling you to be and to do? And will you be willing to get out of the boat in the midst of all the obstacles to trust him who is already doing it, that you can do it? I want to encourage you today to ask that question, not to feel guilty, that's not the design, but to encourage you. Because Jesus conquered all fear. That's the answer. I've been saying this for a long time. Everything that we do is a Band-Aid, man-made Band-Aid. Jesus is the answer to all the things I deal with every day that I see in that hospital I'm at. And Jesus is the answer to every patient that you see and every person you see that is struggling with life. But Jesus is looking for us to work with him, to partner with him, to hold hands with him and get out of the boat. So let's get out of the boat today. Let's get out of the boat tomorrow. And when you're scared and you're out of that boat, you're like, uh oh. Grab someone's hand. Don't stop moving. It's when you stop moving, you start sinking. But when you move, you get closer to Jesus. So let's get closer to Jesus so that we can see God move in our country. I want to encourage you. I want to bless you today. And I want you to know I'm praying for you. And believing in you that you can get out of the boat. And when I'm struggling and my faith is starting to be limited because of fear, walk up to me and encourage me and say, come on, I'm going to hold your hand. Let's get out of the boat 
together and let's achieve what God has called us to be and to do. That's what I want to encourage you with today. Otherwise, you'll be like the 11. You'll never get out of the boat. And you will miss the greatest opportunities that God could ever give to you in your life. I want to encourage you and bless you. I hope that you are blessed this week. And I'm grateful to see all of you. And amen and amen and amen and amen and amen. And